Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our October FOGO Club meeting. Um, today, we are focusing on infrastructure projects and social outcomes. And we've got a fantastic panel of speakers um, with direct experience of um, trying to um, pursue social outcomes through infrastructure projects. Um, and I think this is going to be a really interesting session. Um, please remember um, that the session is being recorded and uh, the recording will be available um, on our website after the event. Um, there will be plenty of opportunity to ask questions, so uh, please uh, feel free to collect up your questions as the speakers are going through their presentations, um, because you will have an opportunity to ask those later and uh, speakers will have a chance to respond. Um, in a, a new and experimental development, um, there'll be an opportunity to stay on for a few minutes after the formal session has ended and after the um, uh, recording has ended in case you have any further questions you want to ask or any further discussion you'd like to have uh, with our speakers. And they very kindly agreed to stay on a little bit longer for that to take place. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to our first panelist, um, Dayan from the OECD, as his background makes clear. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Anne. So this is my first time with the Pogo Group, perhaps just a few seconds uh, where I come from. Uh, I'm a lead procurement strategy specialist in an infrastructure in procurement division at the OECD. And I'm closing in on 20 years of working on contract performance and related issues and also everything else related to infrastructure. And what I will be briefly presenting today in, in seven minutes and 40 seconds left <laughs> is uh, something that is relevant for uh, social impacts and procurement, but does not speak directly to them. As you may know, as one pursues objectives that uh, procurement should take upon its shoulder, be it strategic procurement, environmental issues, uh, social issues, and so forth, uh, we make demands on the supply chains, on the suppliers um, that they need to meet. And that in turn has an impact on and the results of our procurement process, be it prices, be it uh, dates and so forth. So I, I'd like to briefly introduce you to a, a scientific method that we have rolled out last year at the OECD based on many years of cooperation and, and working with the academia as well. Um, that is the first ever evidence-based approach to uh, building procurement strategies. And it pertains, of course, to major projects uh, in infrastructure. I'm assuming you can see my screen. Okay. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what's what's the issue here? So when people talk about procurement, um, there's a narrow conceptualization of uh, what procurement is supposed to entail. And there's a lot of focus on lawyers, legislation, uh, bitter uh, um, selection processes, and, and the contracting process that follows from that point onwards. And uh, when you talk about uh, how to allocate risk in these uh, settings, the focus in the debates around the globe actually today is on the choice of the delivery model. There are very important things though that happen before that. First, you need to be sure about the capabilities that you need to in-house, and that's the make or buy question. Um, this is not about um, you insourcing uh, carpet, carpentry or plumbing services, but it's about intellectual services people that need to manage your contracts, people that need to understand your suppliers. <clears throat> and the second question is the con contract scoping or packaging question, which is about in how many contracts should I break down my major project? And this is not just about size, it's also about interfaces. Where should I draw the line? Where should one contract stop and yeah, another contract begin? And if I do mistakes, uh, to put it this way, bluntly, in these two phases, <clears throat> I will have condemned my project uh, to, to fail, to, to reach uh, something we call procurement failures, 
um, uh, even before I started discussing risk allocation and, and delivery model. And I will just illustrate in a few examples uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. So but by the way, before I begin, uh, we are not the first to have identified these stages and these questions. If you look at the latest UK uh, procurement delivery route map, you will, with some effort, find the same questions. The make or buy question, uh, the, the packaging question, and the delivery model question. But what you will not find is a tool that will help you answer those questions. And that, that is what we are talking about in this particular method uh, that UCD has rolled out last year. <clears throat> so, um, so what? why is this, this make or buy scoping that I'm talking about so, so important? The first thing is that we need to start thinking about major projects as sets of economic activities. It's, it's, it's relevant, it matters whether you package the whole project into one contract or you package it into three contracts, but you need to understand how and why that is relevant to you. For example, let's say that one particular activity is only delivered by two suppliers and maybe another activity is only delivered by two suppliers. So if I package the whole project into a single contract, what will happen is that all the other activities where there are many suppliers will organize around these two. And I will ultimately have two consortia bidding. And this is an example of a procurement failure that has impact on the competition going for your contract. I have reduced the competitive power for all the, the activities which, which have many suppliers to two. And there's empirical evidence that shows, even in major projects, that if you have two suppliers or four, it matters for the ultimate price that you may uh, achieve. So this is, this is one example. And how this is solved is once you've done the due diligence, once you've analyzed which are the economic activities in your project, you can, you can uh, absorb that in the packaging strategy. And what you can do is, for example, you can select a nominated, uh, you can appoint these two to be nominated suppliers and have a separate competition for the other activities. Another example is something we call hold up, which is literally a, a robbery. If you have an activity that is, for example, uh, on a critical path or is in another context that is highly relevant for you, and there's a supplier <clears throat> on that path. For example, I, I need to build the Olympic stadium right on time <clears throat> to deliver the Olympic Games. There are huge reputational concerns on my side. And if the contract with this particular supplier tends to be incomplete, and incomplete means I could not foresee everything that could have happened in that contract in advance, and that happens in many, many circumstances, there will be a renegotiation. And if there will be a renegotiation, the value that that supplier can extract from me because I'm my back is against the wall is far greater than the penalties I can administer on him. And again, if I package this in a single contract, everybody else will join the bandwagon and I'll pay more to everybody else as well. So it matters what happens in the project. And there is a level of granularity required when you play with procurement strategy. Last thing like the uh, stress is that no major project is homogenous in terms of risk and uncertainty. There are many things happening in every major project, and that means I should not apply a single risk allocation principle in major projects. It means, or major contracts, I should be thinking whether there should be several. And that also means I should not be applying a single delivery model to major projects. But first, I need to do my analysis and find where should I apply uh, what? So what, what I've been very briefly summarizing here within my eight minutes, which are expiring, is how to prevent uh, contract uh, procurement failures in major projects. Pre-contract failures, competition failure, and post-contract failure, which is hold up and inadequate risk allocation. And what I've been talking about is all being sorted out in economic theory, economically proven empirically, but nobody has been able to date to operationalize all this. And what we have been doing at the OECD and our academic partner for the past years have been, been we have been operationalizing this and rolling it out. And now 
that we have. It should be relevant for you and your audience. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much indeed um, for that and for uh, keeping beautifully to time. Um, that I was just going to say, can you unshare your screen and you've yes. done it. Um, so, um, Amy, next, uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm not going to use any slide. Uh, can you hear me, first of all? Great. OK, so I'm not going to share any slides. And um, yeah, so, um, I hope that I can kind of add uh, a different aspect to the table uh, for today's discussion. And I'd like to start with this question of what is the social value of infrastructure? What kind of social outcomes are we looking at in relation to infrastructure projects? And social value is defined and experienced by people. And infrastructure supports their lives in places. Um, but so social value, when we think about the social value of infrastructure, we need to consider all these people and the places together. Um, so not only looking at the specific infrastructure, piece of infrastructure, but related development in the wider context and how they interact with infrastructure, how infrastructure enables certain developments and therefore impact people's lives. And uh, an example of in my experience, uh, when I was at the company called Space Syntax, I worked for um, I, I advised for a Milton Keynes transport team. And the, the question was to make an assessment of regional transport infrastructure, i.e. Expressway and East, East West Rail, you might all be familiar with. And, um, but typically in transport world, uh, we might talk about like, shortened journey, like how, how many minutes that this infrastructure will shorten the journeys between A and B. But what we wanted to do was to um, assess in terms of daily needs, in relation to daily needs like shopping, commuting, access to GPs and schools, how these pieces of infrastructure will impact on these day-to-day -day activity for Milton Keynes residents. And we used the uh, kind of urban analytics to do um, some scenario testing. And the analysis, what analysis highlighted was at the end need for complementing local transport and development to make any meaningful difference on Milton Keynes residents' lives. So these, uh, the large scale regional infrastructure. Um, almost had no impact on the commuting or um, or day-to-day -day activities like going to GPs and so on. Um, obviously, because the, our assumption was that you would like to have these activities, day-to-day activities as a local. So this really highlighted the need of um, for kind of business case development um, or evaluating the value of infrastructure. We also need to think about the needs for local transport and the sufficient development um, to, to sort of optimize the social value of infrastructure. And across the industry, we have tendency of jumping on to measuring when it comes to social value. But in the URI report, um, which was mentioned in my uh, introduction on the website, we emphasize the importance of the first step, which is defining desired social outcome. And how we define value in the project specific local and cultural context is really important. And who is involved in defining and how broadly we look at the value chain. Are we thinking broadly enough in practice? So, in general, I think that concept of social value, well-being, um, these things are um, highlighting non-financial benefits. And these concepts started to come into the decision making for um, infrastructure and procurement. And various tools are available. But 
what we are not necessarily good at and what we need to be looking at, I think, is that the value destroyed. Are we looking at the value destroyed as well as value created? And, um, and also, how do we balance between potentially conflicting um, value positions like environmental damage versus social benefit and needs? And these are the kind of practical, pragmatic questions that we are still facing. Um, and, and so we really need to make a balanced outcome-oriented approach more of a common practice. Um, an example of uh, my, my work that con I contributed to um, Transport for London's uh, Social Sustainable Development Framework Development and it's a framework, a decision-making framework to drive outcome-oriented decision-making uh, throughout the life cycle of projects. And this kind of approach would uh, help continuity across change of ownership, responsibility of politics, and enable informed discussions to resolve conflicting elements and uh, when changes are necessary. So these are sort of continuity across different procurements, um, different pieces of procurement. And a similar approach was applied when I worked for Oxfordshire Infrastructure Strategy work with City Science. Um, and an, this kind of framework was uh, trying to design to allow understanding of interactions and trade-offs between individual projects. Um, uh, Diane talked about this kind of packaging earlier, uh, package of different projects, and I think the 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 procure the one who procure needs to also be able to understand how they interact and how the trade-offs occur between these individual projects and uh, depending on how you package as well. So lastly, I'd like to wrap up with a uh, kind of way forward, um, highlight the three areas of, of priority. The first of all, evaluation across borders and discipline. And as, as we highlighted in the RELI report, um, leadership by, uh, by government at all scale is required to create a vision defining what good looks like and the coordinating various activities from infrastructure development, service provision and the partnership um, to make sure social value of infrastructure is optimised. That's a really important role for public sector organisations. Secondly, change of culture and mindset, genuinely outcome oriented approach going beyond monetization. Often that social value is talked about in relation to the, uh, the pounds as a proxy um, metrics, but um, as much as that could be useful in certain contexts, the debate on what cost is needed to achieve certain outcomes that cannot be measured by economic or financial uh, units is really important. And um, it's also, uh, we need to be mindful that community does not always have a single voice. So finding cohesion and agreement through discussion in process is important. So the importance of a debate and discussion there. But lastly, innovation and, um, through tech and the business models. So we need to find a way to achieve desired outcomes while making financial sense for those involved. Um, at the, in the current um, climate, that addressing social and environmental issues isn't optional. So we need to really find a way and we need to work with existing systems to be pragmatic and then really start tackling these issues. That's the end. Fantastic, thank you. And um, again, perfect timing. Um, everyone doing very well on this front today. Um, and uh, without further ado, um, I, I I think um, uh, I I thought Eric was next, but I see Brendan, you unmuted yourself. Were you expecting to go next? Yeah, I believe so. Um, but okay, off, off, yeah. off you go then. Yeah. Sorry, that's I've no written problem. it down in the wrong order. Um, go ahead. 
Not a problem. Thank you, Jan, and and thank you for the invite, guys. Glad to be here uh, this, the, this afternoon. My name is Brendan Gallagher uh, from Northern Ireland, and I'm a social value advisor with the Strategic Investment Board. The Strategic Investment Board is an organisation that is ex exists solely in Northern Ireland. We're here to support the government departments uh, deliver on their infrastructure projects and their their new policies. So we are essentially um, experts who go in and advise the government departments on delivering their infrastructure projects or, or policies. So um, <clears throat> my own background is I've been in SAB now for just over a year, um, helping to roll out the social value policy, which has been new to Northern Ireland. So we're, we're at the very beginning of our journey of social value here in Northern Ireland, but I've had over 16 years um, working in community development, community engagement capacities on major infrastructure and regeneration projects right across Ireland and GB, so plenty of practical experience uh, coming to, to the fold. Um, my pre short presentation this morning, again for the eight minutes, will really give you guys a high level overview of the new social value policy that we have introduced here in Northern Ireland. As I say, we're pretty um, uh, pretty new to this in terms of the actual policy and how it's been applied to uh, public contracts. The, the, the policy was due to be implemented way back in 2016 and 2017, but with, with the political instability here, the legislation never got passed. So we only really got around to applying social value to contracts in June of this year. So I've got literally two slides just to give you that high level overview of what social value means for Northern Ireland, particularly in the, the built environment. Um, so the, the policy was introduced via the, uh, the implementation of policy procurement note 0121. This was a, a, a policy owned by the Department for Finance, rolled out with the Central Procurement Directorate and ourselves here in SIB. So my role with my colleagues was to roll this policy out across all government departments in service contracts, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, IT contracts and constructions and civils contracts as well. So the policy is only a few months old. It became mandatory just on, on the 1st of June of this year. So we're, we're literally four or five months into this policy being rolled out. It is a significant uh, change to our procurement landscape here in Northern Ireland, um, as you can imagine, um, our role essentially has been to uh, advise and support uh, public uh, contracting authorities, layer social value into all ma manner of contracts. But obviously today with the focus on, on construction and civils and infrastructure, I I'll keep it focused on that. Essentially, what that change in procurement landscape means is that from the 1st of June, it's been mandatory to uh, score a minimum of 10% weighting towards your social value. So that was that was sneaking in on the, the quality and cost um, responses within any standard uh, public procurement uh, that, that was run. Just to make you guys aware, the, the policy is only mandatory in any contract over the public contract regulations thresholds for, for construction and civils as any contract over 5.4 million where social value needs to be scored. And any contracts below that where it's uh, professional services or, or smaller contracts, while social value may not be scored in those contracts, uh, we still can include contract performance clauses or we advise to include contract performance clauses to ensure the social value is still delivered on those smaller level contracts within the built environment. Uh, moving forward. So it's a very new concept here. Um, the one benefit our construction sector has um, been, been so close to GB is a lot of our, you know, our, our um, bigger construction brands, the, the construction firms, the civil firms do do quite a lot of engineering and, and construction work um, in GB and are familiar, whether, whether they're the, the lead contractor or supply chain. So they, are, they were already familiar with the terminology of social value, what it meant, what it meant, meant to be delivered. That differs so much, so much or somewhat from our services suppliers here or IT suppliers who social value is, is you know, a very new concept so that we are currently going through that learning curve of what social value is and, and how it should be scored and, and delivered essentially uh, in delivery of, of public contracts. We are already at the early stages of looking at a, a tentative review of the policy. Um, they're, you know, in, in partnership with our, our sponsoring department. Um, to see whether social value should be actually increased up to 20% of, of weighting, which will be a, a significant raise uh, above and beyond that 10%. But again, that, that's all de dependent on the review, how the initial stages of the policy actually delivers. Now, one thing as part of this policy, we, we 
obviously want to make social value as uh, innovative and provide as much flexibility as possible to uh, uh, bidders and uh, contractors who are going for government contracts so what we've tried to do here is include this kind of shared understanding of what social value is so whether you're working on a service contract it contract or in the built environment these four key themes are aligned to all procurement so it's increasing secure employment skills building ethical resilient supply chains delivering zero carbon promoting well-being those won't be will, will be very familiar terms or everyone on, on this call but to, un, to ensure that there was a consistency and continuity um, of a role of social value we want to ensure that the, these themes were consistent across all uh, government contracts the, the flexibility is built in that beneath these four key pillars there is a range of um, innovative creative indicators that contractors once they're once they're going for their social value contracts can apply those indicators to you know address their business needs help the, the government departments that live in their corporate objectives and unique ways they actually find the, the social economic and environmental uh, additionality to government contracts essentially so in northern ireland we have quite a, a unique model as I've said, the, the social value score only applies to any contracts that are over the, the, the threshold of 5.3 million. But again, below that, we, we do encourage contract performance clauses to ensure social value is captured. We have a unique model here in Northern Ireland in terms of how we measure our social value. So in any, con in any um, contract, um, what, we're actually, what, what the calculation is to determine what is proportionate on, on social value, for every million pound worth of government con contract, um, 100 social value points must be delivered per million point of contract value. So that, that stems right across our services, our IT contracts, and again, in our construction and civils contracts. It's deemed to be a proportionate amount of social value um, per million point of, of invoice value. And those points are broken down into a, a number of uh, indicators. Um, it, it ranges from paid employment down to bringing, you know, micro businesses or social enterprises in the supply chains to increasing uh, or improving the health and well-being of contract workforce or in creating creative innovative environmental techniques to reduce carbon emissions during contract delivery depending on the nature of the activity you're going for will determine how many points did you actually get for an example if you were to bring in someone with a you know with a barrier to employment who, who comes from a, a, a um an area of deprivation and do them in the employment chain, you would get 75 points for giving someone a year's worth of work so the procurement is it looks at the methodology of how our bidders will actually deliver their number of points over the duration of the contract so it's quite a, a unique concept but something that gives a a lot of ownership to our bidders to go away and think okay here's our social value this is what must, must be delivered here's your flexibility to go away assess your business needs assess what the contract is and tell us how you're going to deliver your number of points over the duration of the contract but it really when, when the social value is being scored on contracts it's actually looking forward so we're asking our bidders to give us a, a very clear defined methodology for how they will deliver contracts uh, or deliver this contract based on the nature of the contract so we're not asking them to look back at previous uh, examples that they've done or previous activity they've delivered on on past contracts but looking forward to actually address uh, the needs of, of the contract look at the, the the contracting authority what their corporate objectives are but also looking at the, the program for government that's set down by northern ireland looking at how individuals how communities how um, small businesses can really get in on government spend that's essentially what our social value policy is it's looking at the, the three million spend our government spends every year procuring services and construction projects how that money filters down through the departments through the contracts and then how the suppliers uh, deliver that social value out across northern ireland to as i said individuals communities and, and small businesses that's the real emphasis of what we want to try with, with our social value one of our major benefits here is that we do give our suppliers huge degree of flexibility over what they choose and how they deliver it essentially and while we're at this very early stages of social value we are everyone's grappling with it everyone's getting the use getting used to the, the terminology what it actually means but hopefully in the next number of years we'll see you know innovation creeping to this people become a lot more comfortable and familiar with what, what what social value actually is you know how suppliers can be innovative in their delivery of social value so hopefully we'll see in the next couple of years a real rapid growth 
of innovative activities and case studies starting to come to the fore in terms of Northern Ireland's social value. But um, <clears throat> it, it, it's something that the early months, it, it's, the policy has landed quite well. We haven't had any challenges and any contracts that we're aware of yet. Um, and people we're finding the businesses and suppliers are, are very keen to deliver um, meaningful social value and, and avoid it being tick box exercises as well. So it, it has been a hugely busy period. We've been both um, um, informing and uh, supporting our, our contract authorities layer social value into their contracts and then we're also looking now at the stage of, of how contracts are actually being managed and monitored in terms of the activity that's been delivered to ensure that the, the, the government money works harder for individuals and communities across Northern Ireland. That's a very high level overview. Um, I'm going to stop there just in the interest of time, but happy to take any questions once we get to the, the Q&A session. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Brendan. Um, and then uh, last but not least, um, Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anne. Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, as you might have uh, seen, if you had a, a chance to look us up, Real Worth has been going well more than seven years now. We, it's probably worth saying a few words about our motivation and why we we're formed before I go on to, to talk uh, about my topic, which is why uh, and how people are important uh, to built environment, including infrastructure. We were formed by two, two uh, people who knew each other quite a long time. Uh, Phil Hyam, co-founder, has worked in uh, construction and development all of his life. Uh, I've been uh, effectively a sustainable change um, impact as assessment uh, uh, practitioner, uh, and we always used to moan when we met each other. We said to uh, each other, why is it that uh, all the pro-social and pro-environmental stuff always gets stripped out of projects little by little, uh, 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 inevitably and inexorably towards, uh, the end, uh, towards the start date until you have virtually none? Uh, and the reason is always that it, 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 there's just not enough money in the scheme. Uh, and all the wonderful reports and advice we used to give are, always used to be received uh, uh, very kindly and said, well, next time, next time when we take a project on, you'll you'll be advising us and we'll get it right next time. Uh, and next time never happened. So uh, are we radically different nowadays? I, I think we have marched along. I'll talk a bit about that in in, in a second. But effectively, the, the, our journey started with uh, really my discovery through being on the board of a social enterprise uh, of social return on investment. Many of you know that's a, that's a method of, uh, of identifying, measuring and reporting on, on social value uh, and uh, being able to monetize that. Um, and uh, of course, it, uh, it came into its own, uh, really, uh, we're at the 10 year anniversary of the advent of social value and procurement, really, with the, with the UK Social Value Act. Uh, what really strikes home when you look at uh, social return on investment is how important people are. Uh, and I'll explain that uh, in, in a second. But, the important thing, uh, I think, in my sort of early points is, is that if you're a commissioner or, or, or a bidder and you haven't thought uh, carefully about how you affect people, it's a bit uh, difficult to understand how you're addressing social value at all. As Amy said, uh, social value is created by people. It's not created by anyone else. You, you can crack on that you are creating social value because of the interventions you're you're making. But uh, if it doesn't affect people and they don't react to that, either positively or negatively, social value doesn't happen. It has to be all about people. And yet, bizarrely, a lot of our um, evaluation uh, and bidding uh, mechanisms don't concentrate very clearly on people's lived experience, either anticipated or actual, because there's rarely that much follow up in the post completion stage. So what's my remedy? Well, I think we could do worse than always remember the eight principles uh, of the social uh, return on investment community, uh, which of course is understand change. If you haven't understood and, and, and stated what change, how you are gonna affect people's lives uh, and simply saying, we're gonna do this, we're going to do that, 
it's difficult to understand how 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 uh, the statements you're making are going to uh, should resonate with, with commissioners. Uh, and there's, there's easy ways to to understand and do that, mostly through evidence base and taking data uh, uh, and showing uh, how you how you have done that in the past. You need to to value outcomes that matter and only include what's material. In other words, just concentrate on those things that are going to affect people's lives. Don't overclaim. Plagued the social value community in the early days. I think there's less of that now because people are much more understanding of, of what you can and can't say. Uh, be transparent, be very clear about how you come to, to the figures and statements that you, you make. Verify if you can with third parties or at least other stakeholders and be responsive. Uh, understand what the needs are of the community uh, and then uh, be able to put your uh, proposals against what, what is needed and not what you, you can afford or what you think you want. But fundamentally, the eighth one is involve stakeholders. If you don't involve stakeholders, it's very hard to, to, to see how you can put a social value argument together in the first place. And we do wish that more commissioners would ask more questions about how that process has taken place. So, I thought uh, I would try to explain this in uh, in a case study uh, that that we're doing at the moment. We we work on some infrastructure projects, but a lot of our work is in large regeneration projects, which of course involve uh, elements of uh, of um, of infrastructure. We worked on and are working on big projects like the Mayfield Regeneration Area in Manchester, uh, the Everton Stadium uh, project in Liverpool and uh, the Earl's Court uh, Regeneration uh, Programme in, uh, in London. And our process is always the same. First, understand what's going on around you. What are the socioeconomic, uh, con what's the socioeconomic context in which people live? If you don't understand that, it's very hard to understand what changes you can make with your intervention. Try to get into sentiment surveys well before the intervention is even known to people so that you can understand how people feel about the area and what their aspirations are. Sure, then get into the pre-app uh, reaction phase about what they think of your proposals. Try to put some alternatives to them. And then, of course, uh, get into the post-occupation stage. Don't, don't just uh, depart find out if your uh, um, uh, pr uh, projections have been uh, accurate. What do people think once you actually provide uh, uh, the development uh, that, you, that you promised? That really rarely happens ev even today, uh, and it really should. So at Earl's Court, uh, people said, uh, as a result of that sort of effort, uh, not in exclusively by us, they wanted more green space, especially multi-purpose green space, art and culture initiatives, places to work locally, places to meet. If anybody knows that part of London, you, you could identify with all of those reasonable aspirations. And so what we do and, and we would do on any project is then work with designers, architects, putting together master plans and, and detail plans to try to build those things in, pro-social elements and features management issues and even occupier tenancy agreements to make sure that the, that that as much of that can be delivered in at any one time um and then uh, the evaluation of scenarios is also very important what are the choices what kinds of combinations of pro social features can be introduced into a, into a project which is going to offer the most social value uh, can anything that that uh, people have suggested be logically introduced into the into the project uh, under the un, under the existing physical and, and economic constraints? All of these things just help better decision making, uh, and social value then becomes um, a, a decision making tool rather than some kind of 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 test or or it, dare I say it a tick box to be achieved so to get through a procurement uh, situation. It becomes a progressive uh, adjunct to a better society. And ultimately that's what we're, we're all shooting for. 
that's the point of, of concentrating on, on social value. And so, I mean, in conclusion, I'd say um, there's many advantages uh, of introducing this in, into, the pro into the process. It makes uh, a scheme much more responsive. It offers a route to acceptance uh, from surrounding communities. It makes the project better. Uh, and it also highlights how well the development team can work together in order to, to bring something to fruition for the greater good. And I guess, why would you do anything if it wasn't for the greater good? So thank you very much. I look forward to reaction to that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so we've got a few minutes for questions. I see there's um, been uh, some interesting discussion in the chat that our speakers um, may want to respond to shortly, but would anyone um, like to raise their little electronic hand and ask a question? It's all gone quiet. <laughs> I don't know how to raise a hand. Ah, um, <laughs> hello, Peter. Um, please go ahead and ask a question without raising your hand. I, I, I'm very interested in the, the Northern Ireland uh, policy because I, I haven't seen that before and I've been putting contentious things in the chat. Um, it, it, does, it does worry me, if I understand it correctly, the supplier is doing a sort of tick box thing with scores against various social value activities. Yeah, and they have to get to 100. And then you're actually going to measure how well they write the essay about delivering that 100. My, my point really is I, I don't do a lot of consulting work now, but I, I do some buy side and some sell side. So I, I advise companies sometimes on bidding or whether they should uh, complain when they don't win contracts. Um, and, and companies, get, it's a game. It is a game. Scoring the best score is is a game um and and i think they'll look at it and their first point will be right what's the easiest and lowest cost way we can hit the 100 points and having worked worked out what the answer to that is then they'll just write a really good essay about how how they'll do it um and and include i think you had climate change in as one of the categories that has ticks in the box well, I mean, they'll be doing, most firms are doing that anyway. They're going to have carbon reduction plans. They're going to have net zero plans if they're bidding for UK government work, because they have to have that now. It's all going to sound really impressive. So I suspect quite a lot of them will tick that box. And, and that will bring no social value at all to the citizens of some deprived part of Belfast or, or Derry, I would say. Um Thank you very much, Peter, for that. Brendan, hold that thought. Um, you can come back to it in a moment. Um, yep. I know that Caroline Nicholas would also like to come in uh, with a comment or question. Caroline. Hi, everybody. Those were really fascinating um, presentations. Thank you for that. It's an area I know very little about. So I have a very simple question. Sometimes a better social value might be not to do a particular project at all, either not to do it or to do a different project. Now, I know some of you touched on the planning side. How much is that? And, and this is a particular question, for example, if you're looking at choosing also between procurement projects and PPPs, particularly where, you know, unsolicited bids and things come in. So I'm just wondering how much in your system are these issues really looked at in deciding whether to go ahead with a project or is it only coming in once a project is sort of in the pipeline or, or really de pretty definitely going ahead. Thanks a lot. Um, brilliant, thanks for that, Caroline. Um, so um, in view of the time, um, I think it's probably uh, appropriate to, to move on and, and hear from our speakers again. Um, please feel free to respond to the questions and comments that you've heard and any of the stuff in the chat or stuff that other members of the panel said. Um, and we'll go back round in order. So, um, Dayan, you're up first. Uh, thank you. Perhaps let's start with the last uh, question. What, what I was talking about is about the procurement strategy. What comes before is the planning. And uh, we know absolutely that 
the first and the greatest sin is to build the wrong project. The second smaller sin, but still quite big, is to build the right project badly. So uh, absolutely, the social consideration should start in the planning phase. And the UK is one of the most developed countries in the world as far as public investment management is concerned and how projects are appraised. But there is still a lot of room for, for development. In terms of uh, procuring uh, uh, things in a way that is, uh, let's say, value for money, not just focusing on the social element, there is a lot more work to be done in the UK and in the rest of the world than it is in the area of appraisal because there's so much subjective judgment uh, in, in decision making. And that's why we have rolled out our method, which is supposed to be evidence based. And um, I'd like to wrap up with that just to not talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very Which much. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amy, have you got any um, concluding remarks or responses? Yes, um, thank you. I, I would like to um, just two um, comments in the chat um, sort of uh, caught my eye. Um, first one is that there are kind of discussion around the kind of percentage of social value in procurement, whether it should be 10%, 20%, um, things like that, or should it be uh, scoring um, in relation to what we have been just discussing. Um, I have a fundamental question. This is just kind of, I'll, I'll leave with a question, but my question is why social value has to be a separate criteria. Um, I think that the whole response should be um, assessed in terms of the quality, which includes the social value um, of, of the whatever the project. And so I think that's uh, one question for the existing system, which we're probably not going to solve, uh, but I just wanted to put it out there. The second point is a short answer. Um, it's the point about the viability. Um, I think there is a misconception that, it, that there has to be a trade-off between social value creation and uh, sort of profit efforts, for example. But I think it is um, starting to kind of merge or that, that people are realizing that it could be aligned. So for example, office buildings, that they need to, um, the tenant needs to attract their employees to come back to work and so considering what users want, um, ultimate users want, and invest in amenities, well-being support, and things like that is requisite for attracting potential tenants and therefore attracting investors and buyers. So there are lots of areas where uh, these interests are aligned. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Brendan, um, you had some questions to address. Yeah, and I was I was definitely expecting that. And thanks. Um, suppose, um, yeah, I was always very conscious of trying to explain our model in full in, in such a short period of time. But yeah, Peter, doesn't completely take your point there about the the gamification of of the procurement process. Suppose what we what we have tried to do here um, in Northern Ireland is while the policy and guidance has been developed, uh, touches on a point that Eric made there. We essentially um, have been really encouraging our or contracting authorities to really engage at the earliest possible opportunity, you know, with local communities impacted by construction or civil engineer or civil engineering projects to understand what the impact would be, to understand what the the aspirations and the concerns of the project would be, and so the the contracting authorities would get a really strong sense of how social value could start to, you know, address some of the social economic and environmental uh, benefits of the investment essentially and an investment in Northern Ireland you know isn't always forthcoming due to our historical issues and due to the, you know, obviously the, the unique political situation we have here so essentially the feedback from the communities and the pre-market engagement is embedded within the business case then of, of the investment that then kind of informs or contracting authorities what social value is actually relevant and, and we've got a delivery plan which I probably haven't got time to show you now which really um, calculates the number of points that must be delivered over the duration of the contract so if it's a 50, 50 million pound contract 5,000 points must be delivered 
the contracting authorities are identifying where they're going to score their points in the, the social value delivery plan. They also then provide a, a clear methodology for the activities that they will deliver. So just to touch on your point there regarding the, the environmental impacts, completely completely take your point there that it is a you know mandatory aspect of procurement that you know the environmental aspect of the contract must be considered. But suppose we're looking here about additionality, you're looking here about marginal gains, we're asking about you know how the contract workforce um can during delivery of the contract can you know, reduce emissions can, you know, some creative initiatives is like, you know, encouraging contact staff to car share their work to cut down the number of car journey miles. Can they use public transport to get to work, which is a major challenge we have here in Northern Ireland? Um, or can they use their resources and expertise to engage with local community groups or voluntary community organisations to pass on environmental information so whilst they've been rewarded with the government contract they're using their full uh, suite of resources and power and and um equipment to disperse and and share with the communities around these projects so it, it can be yeah you know it can be the procurement process can be up for the gamification but due to the points based system we have and contractors actually dictating where they're getting their points and how many points they're going to get from doing something the methodology really is quite clear in what they must do so they must demonstrate quite clearly how they will deliver against employment opportunities or environment or promoting well-being or supply chain management so again I hopefully would have had an opportunity to explain that in a lot more detail which would have joined a few more dots for you guys but we, obviously in a new policy we, we are keeping a very close eye on it as we're still very early we've still got a small sample size of how it's actually working but we will be carrying that out in the review in terms of how the how the responses then equate to effective delivery and the effective rollout of social economic and environmental benefits in the contract fantastic um thank you very much indeed um and uh last but not least eric Thanks, thanks, Anne. I mean, first, let, let me just um, say how heartened I was just then to, to hear Brendan saying, he didn't actually say this, but effectively learning the lessons of, of the implementation of the Social Value Act uh, um, in, in the rest of Britain, and, and particularly the lesson that if, if you define uh, social value narrowly, you get a very narrow return uh, to think about the effect of on people's lives uh, of um, of buying uh, goods and services, which is enormous, uh, has enormous implications. Is absolutely the right way to go, and I really encourage uh, your progress in that area, Brendan. I, I uh, was going to just um, latch on to something Amy said in her uh, presentation, particularly when she was talking about that case study in Milton Keynes, just to extend the points I was making uh, about. Uh, making sure that uh, you interpret social value as, as widely as possible. Um, in my experience, uh, particularly infrastructure, but also large large projects, just focus on uh, on on the physical uh, uh, um, initiative. Uh, very rarely, sort of stray beyond the red line, uh, and that can't be right, can it? Because uh, these projects have huge reach. Uh, around and uh, uh, and and further, depending on uh, who interacts with them. I mean, for example, infrastructure projects have a huge um, uh, impact on facilitating work or or social connections. Um, that people's sense of place is is affected both positively and negatively. Uh, many people's mental health uh, is affected either positively or, or negatively, depending on on how that development affects them. Uh, Work-life balance, uh, the list goes on. It, it, it's so important to understand how people uh, feel, what their fears are, and afterwards, as I said before in, in my uh, opening remarks, how they feel now once something's completed. And so it's it's very heartening to hear Amy talk about the project in, in Milton Keynes focusing on day-to-day -day lives and not simply on, on the immediate area uh, of where, you know, concrete and steel is being placed. And, and that, that can only strengthen social value, the social value community in the future. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, can I thank um, all of our panellists for um, a great discussion um, and for bringing really diverse perspectives to bear on uh, questions around social value and infrastructure 
Um, thank you also to everyone who's been participating in, in the chat, which has been uh, really interesting and lively um, today. Um, can I encourage you to register for the next session, um, which is about um, supply chain uh, due diligence and procurement, which I think is a really interesting topic with um, all sorts of potential social and environmental relevance too. So um, that's our November theme. Um, please sign up for that now. Um, and can I also uh, thank um, Jess for her support today. So uh, Jessica Reedy, who's on the call, who, who's been emailing you, is the new Policy Engagement and Communications Associate at the GoLab, and she will be helping us with um, POGO organisation and keeping us all on track. So um, thank you, Jess, for your work today and uh, welcome uh, to the group. Um, so uh, that concludes the, the formal proceedings, unless I've uh, missed something, Rory. Um, and so what will happen now is the recording will stop. Um, our speakers have kindly agreed to stay on for a few